you know, a new day, a new headline. It seemingly doesn't end, does it? <laughs> That's correct. It's called investor fatigue, and investor fatigue is not going to go away because this elevated volatility will be persisting for some time. And let's just really have a bit of a take a backdrop and review what's happened. When the U.S. is downgraded by S&P, split rating, Moody's and Fitch keep their AAA. Obvious, an obvious consequence is the rest of the world can't be rated higher than the U.S. balance sheet. That's the reality, and this is the consequence of that. Also, with the S&P announcement this morning, or just earlier today, with, with, uh, with Italy, it's a shot over the bow, effectively, for the political process. So they're effectively sending that consistent message of, we understand that democracies are adversarial in their language and have to debate everything, uh, but we're not happy with the speed of it, and we just need a bit more concrete evidence and a bit of a road path or road map along the way. And remember, at the beginning of September, the biggest headwind the financial markets had following the most unforgiving month of August with the big sell-off, September was all about can the EU ministers, the central bank, the ECB and the IMF agree on outcomes? Can we, we all know that we need EU ministers to agree on the EFSF. We need consistency, open transparency, coordinated central bank intervention and we just need systemic risk to be avoided because we all know one thing it's loud and clear from 2008 and 2009 and that is post Lehman you've effectively all policy makers have got the playbook to play with they know the consequence of letting something go and they know what's required they just need the urgency to get all those EU ministers to work collaboratively together and in conjunction with central banks so the playbook's there they know what's required and I just need to get a move on for financial George. markets because this elevated volatility is not going to go away. Yeah, uh, George, I mean, it's also the fact that uh, these uh, ra ratings agencies, Standard & Poor's, of course, is the one I'm going to concentrate on here, be pushing authorities there in Italy to get austerity going. And, of course, we had that $74 billion package that was passed by Parliament. But this has been happened. This is on the other side of it. They looked at it and gone, right, actually, we're not happy with the way you're growing and you're not going to grow very much, if at all, in the next two years. And this is the real reason for it, isn't it? Well, that's part of it. But the other part, remember, is, as I mentioned before, is that the U.S. had its downgrade, so therefore, by definition, everyone should have a slight downgrade in relative to the U.S. But the important thing is Italy, as a, as a bond market, has got very long-duration bonds. That's a positive. When you strip out its interest rate payments, they do run budget balance surpluses. Italy and Spain are major economies in Europe. They're very productive economies in Europe. They've got demographics going to pension phase. That is true. The likelihood of one of those economies having trouble with its bond program in the decade ahead is quite small in my mind. The issues are with Greece at the moment and manage that partial default and to, to prevent any contagion into the European banking sector. That's what they need to do. But Italy in itself has got good, good fundamentals, long duration debt, and at five and a half or a ten year it's quite compelling with a massive margin. And remember, Italy is trading on a five year CDS twice Kazakhstan. It doesn't seem to make sense, but having said all of that, Italy may be cheaper in the bond market in the month ahead, but it seems like a good on-balance trade to be accumulating Italian bonds in the coming, in coming months and quarters. George. Because a default right, scenario George. for such a major economy, just, it seems inconceivable. Yeah, George, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at what you just said and uh, listening to what you just said uh, and saying, uh, well, you know, how does this change your strategy or investment strategy? Yeah, it's had a big impact on our investment strategy. And towards the end of August, we've had our investment committee meetings around the world, and we shaved our overweight to global equities from our strategic benchmarks. Our overweight to cash, we started going overweight cash in May and have kept increasing that to our strategic benchmarks. And now we have a 7% overweight to the cash asset class. So it's had major implications because of that volatility. We can't see the drivers or the catalysts for the equity markets globally to uh, resume that sort of reacceleration again, that price appreciation. Equity as an asset class, they're cheap. Multiples, trailing one year forward, EPS is coming through with expectations are downgraded, price to book on banking sectors. No matter what I look at, equities are very, very cheap and good value. Having said that, again, the catalysts and those headwinds are still with us. We need to see downgrades of earnings to slow down versus the upgrades. We need George. some consolidation in the weeks and months ahead.